Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's breakout session on farm safety assessment, protecting the next generation of farmers, presented by Laura Daniels and John Quirk. Laura, at Hartwood Farms, Cobb, Wisconsin, Laura and her husband, Jared Searles, takes great joy in teaching their children, Nathan 13 and Julia 9, their values as they work together. While Laura and Jared share in the ownership of the farm, it is Laura who serves as general manager in charge of day-to-day -day operations. They have six full-time employees, 300 Jersey cows, and operate 650 acres of crop and pasture land. More recently, she is hitting the road to deliver pro-ag and motivational speeches across the country, inspiring many to find their passion, build their skills, and have confidence to tell their story. Laura also does consulting in the areas of team building, employee management, and dairy cattle nutrition for Star Blends located in Sparta, Wisconsin. And our other speaker is John, and he has been with Rural Mutual, Mutual Insurance Company since October of 1988. He started out as a personal lines underwriter and then moved on to underwrite commercial lines. In June of 1995, John became the director of marketing services where he was responsible for rural's cor corporate advertising, telemarketing, and co-op programs, as well as agent education and training. In January of 2008, John became the senior product specialist where he worked on a wide variety of coverage enhancements, including regulatory issues with OCI. In March of 2011, John rejoined marketing as the director of marketing. Prior to joining Rural Mutual, John worked as a commercial underwriter with Sentry Insurance. He was also an independent insurance agent for six years in Seattle, Washington. John lives in Green Bay, Wisconsin and with his wife, Nancy, and they have two sons, Andrew and Michael. Please join me in welcoming John and Laura. Well, thanks, Rosalie. I guess after all is said and done with that introduction is I've been doing insurance for a long, long time, uh, more than anything else. But I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today and thank you all for coming and being a part of this session. One of the things that led us to start talking about this was back about three and a half years ago, I'm a discussion meet judge for the Wisconsin Farm Bureau Federation. And one of the topics that they were talking about was farm safety. And as I was sitting there as a judge listening to the contestants talk about it, I was taken back by the last comment that was made uh, by one of the contestants. And they said, well, we talked about a lot of really interesting things today, but you know what? I don't think anybody really cares. And I really don't think anybody's gonna do anything about it. And that was my like, wow moment. I went, really? We gotta do something about this. And so we went back to the office, we started talking a little bit more about this and saying, you know, there is something that we should be able to do. As the leading insurer of farms in the state of Wisconsin, we ought to be paying attention to this and talking about it a little bit more. And then about two months later, I was at the Wisconsin Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Conference, and I met someone from the National Farm Medicine Center. And she came up to our booth and she said, hey, you know, we're doing a safety program and we have a lot of information regarding safety on the farm for kids. Would you be interested? And it was like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah, we'd love to talk to you about it. And so I had the opportunity to go to Marshfield and to talk to the folks there and learn about their programs and their resources that they have. The challenge that they have is that they don't have a way to distribute the information. They got great information, but they have no way of distributing it. And so I said, you know what, I think we can help you. I work for two really great organizations, one being the Wisconsin Farm Bureau Federation, the other one with Rural Mutual Insurance. We're out on farms every day. So we'd be happy to share your information and distribute it. And so we started this partnership and we built some resources for you and we'll talk about that in a little bit, about where you can go and find information because that was the one thing in the discussion meet they talked about. They said, you know, trying to find information on the internet is really tough. You gotta spend a lot of time doing a lot of searching, going to a lot of different places to find this stuff. It'd be great if there was just one place that we could do, go to and find that information out. And so that's part of what we developed and that's part of what we built. 
The other thing that really startled me and got my attention to this and why I, I kind of am all in on this program is that the statistics that are coming out of the National Fire Medicine Center when you talk about children on the farm are pretty alarming. And the one that got me the most was that every 3.2 days, a child dies in a farm-related accident in the United States. 3.2 days. That's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. And that's why getting the word out, educating people as much as possible is what's kind of driving me to do this. And I don't know, you know, whether or not you go to a presentation like this and go back to your farm and take a look at what's going on, or you go to our website and you look at some of the information and you take some of that back. I don't know what the results are on that. But what I hope, what I hope is that if we can prevent one more child from getting seriously injured or killed on a farm, it's all worthwhile. And so that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Why farm safety? Kind of what we talked about. Some of the safety concerns. Some stories. We'll be showing you a video about farm families and some of the stories that they want to share. We'll talk a little bit about that farm safety evaluation and how you can use it and what's going on with that. And some of the farm safety resources that we have created for you that you can use along the way. And then some action steps. But the first action step that I want to take is I want to introduce to you Laura Daniels. Most of you know Laura. She was your keynote speaker last year. Laura is probably the best ag advocate that I know. And she has passion. All of you who know Laura know Laura has passion. And when, passion, and when Laura is committed to something, she is 100% in. And I was very happy to convince Laura to be a part of this with us, uh, to be a co-presenter, to be a co-partner with me in these presentations. Because Laura not only brings her passion with it, but she brings her experience of being a manager, a co-owner on a farm, probably more importantly than anything else, being a mom and having kids that live on that farm and be able to tell those stories. So with that, here's Laura. It's always awesome when you can get a round of applause before you even do anything, right? Hello. So um, my friend Carrie is sitting by me here in the front row. And uh, when John was saying how I'm all in on everything, she whispered in my ear, except for that whole turning 40 thing. You weren't very all in on that. <laughs> so thanks for the reminder, Carrie. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I think part of the reason uh, John asked me to get involved with this is because so much of what I spend my time with women like you, you know, not just here in Wisconsin, but thankfully now, like across the nation, hello, it's crazy. But part of what I do is reconnect you to your passion. And in many ways, that is the reason why you farm. It's the reason why you're involved in agriculture. Um, we are so passionate about having our families with us on the farms. And that is one of the things that drew, drew many of you to this business, to this way of life, is having the chance to work side by side with your family, your husband, your children, your employees, your cows. Um, and part of that, uh, there are a lot of traditions. And some of those traditions are amazing. The, the lessons that our children can learn, um, life and death, I think, is one of the most important things that they learn just being on a farm. But some of those traditions are not OK. And we have to be able, as moms and as leaders of our businesses, to look at that and say, you know, what is a good tradition? And what is something we've done for a long time that needs to change? What do we need to make into a new and different tradition? Uh, growing up, I spent a lot of time on the fender of a, a 4010 tractor or the International 606. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I always thought that little handle that, when, you know, when you get up onto the tractor, you know, it's cut out and it's got rubber around it so you can grab on. I always thought that was for the kid to hold on to so you didn't fall off. Turns out it's actually just, you know, so you can step up safely. And, um, that's one of the things that I think we really need to challenge ourselves on. Is it, is it OK to have our kids side by side in a situation that's almost always safe, but not always? 
And so some of what John and I are going to talk to you about today uh, has to do with that. It has to do with making new and better traditions. Because as the slide shows, you know, we take so much pride in the traditions that we have on farm. For those of you who were here last year, if you remember, I gave you this long list of values. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because two of my own value words, uh, gentleness and reliability, to me, they can also embody farm safety. One of the reasons we teach all of our employees and my children and my husband, <laughs> one of the reasons we teach them to be really gentle with our cows is because it's a safer working environment. If the cows are quiet, we will have less injuries to both cows and people. And so, yeah, it's a value word. I spent a lot of time talking about that last year, but there's a farm safety message there as well. Reliability is another word that's really important to me. That started out through me encouraging my employees to come to work on time. If you remember back to last year, I was having a lot of trouble with that. And uh, when we started choosing people based on how reliable they were, things changed with, uh, with our team at the dairy. Um, reliability is also a word that I'm trying hard to embody. Sometimes I say yes to too many things, and I can't follow through on them all. And so I'm trying myself to be more reliable. But reliability, again, has a farm safety message. As the owner of, of my dairy, together with my husband, it's my job to make sure that my people are safe. And so making sure that the guards are on our equipment, making sure that the electricity is properly grounded, making sure that we're not pushing them so hard that they work so quickly that they make poor decisions. We can set the traditions for our own farms. We can make new, um, new traditions that are safer. And so one of the really important things to remember is that children are the ones who are at the most risk for farm accidents. And I think as moms, how many of you are moms? Okay, how many of you are raising kids on a farm or have done that? Okay, same hands, right? It's um, farm safety, we think about the children so much, and you should. As John mentioned, they're the ones who can be injured. But one of the things that I don't think we always think about are the other children who are at the farm. You have worked hard to educate your own children on what's safe and what's not. But what about their friends who come over? What about the children of your employees? How many of you have employees who have families who might visit the farm? I know that's a concern of mine. Sometimes there will be kids that just show up at my farm, and I don't, you know, I'm not sure how they're cousins of someone. And so those children are also at a lot of risk. And so we have to remember them as well. It's not just your children, it's the other children who are there. And so this is really an important statistic. 80% of the children who are injured on farms were not working when the accident occurred. So that means they were small and they were not trained to do a job or they were a visitor or a bystander to the job that was being performed. This is important. You've spent so much time teaching your own children to be safe working on the farm. They are at less risk because of that time and dedication you have put into them. So keep in mind the other children. And so as you know, small children would be counted as bystanders. They, there's no age appropriate task for a child less than six. And so what we need to do is remember that they are a bystander and they are um, more likely to be injured. 75% of farm injury deaths in this age group, zero to six, are a result of a machinery accident where they were nearby or they fell from a tractor, like I said about the fender, riding on the fender, or drowning or suffocation. Um, you've heard about the kids playing in the, in the gravity box. That, that would be an example of that. When they're small, that just seems like such a great place to play, um, and it's just not. And so what I would like to do is have John come back up and uh, introduce to you a video. And I would just like to say that 
uh, John Quirk has really, really put his passion into making sure that this whole farm safety program is moving forward with rural mutual insurance, and they, they have gone above and beyond. This is not about selling insurance at all. This is about helping all of you keep the people at your farm safe, and I really think that there's probably no one more passionate about that than, than John. He's really put his heart and soul into this. And with that, I would like him to come up, back up here and introduce the video. Well, thanks, Laura. The video is uh, kind of a montage of videos that we have available for you as part of our resources. Um, on our website on farm safety, we have about eight different videos that are there. One is completely about moms and a moms forum, so I encourage you to take a look at that. But this one is kind of a, a montage of all of it. We're talking about three different farm families. They're talking about their exposure with their kids and what's happened to them as far as the stories go. We also have a little bit here from uh, Middleton EMS as a first responder on the scene and what they deal with and go through. And then we also have a person from the Marshfield Clinic, uh, the, farm, the National Farm Safety Council, uh, also talk a little bit too. So I want to share this video with you. part of farming is seeing how your crops, you plant them, they grow, you harvest them, and then you feed them to the animals, and you see how the animals grow. Sharing that with your family is amazing. The rigors of farming place high demands. Sometimes risk is out of their hands. In, in many ways. I think there's all of the things in farming are moving, have moving parts, um, and one accident can cause major problems for many people. Over the 20 years um, that I've been here in Middleton and also previous to this, uh, other areas in Wisconsin, I've seen 20 or so different types of agriculture related, uh, farm related incidents, and many of them not so serious, some very serious. It takes a village to raise a child and a family to raise a farm. The most important work, keep them free from harm. pig barn we used to have pigs at this farm but now we got out of that and we went into dairy farming he was up at the farm with my husband and he um, was near a grain auger and he um, went into the auger and accidentally you know got his arm caught in the in the auger he's been great about it you know he never has um, complained anything like that, and he can do just about anything. He plays baseball, football, he wrestles, he plays soccer, and um, he loves to farm. You know, even when he came home from the accident, he even said, well, when can we go back to the farm? This was just the next day. A 
nine-year-old boy has died after falling into a grain bin. there that day and we've been out there probably for two and a half hours. Uh, we had just stopped and um, he had had his first gooseberry and first uh, black, black cap or black raspberry. We stopped underneath a walnut tree at that time and they picked the back end of the ranger up with, with walnuts. Um, just pulling a little brush hog behind our ranger, uh, no bigger than the width of the ranger and he had to go real slow on it uh, because anything over five miles an hour and it wouldn't cut. Uh, we just got around the corner, probably had maybe two, three minutes left when we'd be done for the day. And uh, the kids had behaved the entire day. He stood up in the back of the ranger to grab a walnut as we passed. And as he grabbed the walnut, he never let go. And the walnut never came off the tree, and it pulled him. And he stumbled off the back of the four-wheeler. And there's not much clearance on the bottom of those brush hogs, so it rolled up on top of him, and um, he went underneath it. impacted by it, whether it's family members or co-workers who either witness it or are somehow involved in the rescue, you know, they, it also impacts them long term, so, because uh, they, they certainly have to remember all of those things that they witnessed and saw and, and all the events that took place. When they leave the house, I'll often say, just be safe, be careful, you know, Make sure you're walking with your head up, make sure you know where you're going and your surroundings. Especially when we're doing hay and stuff, there's a lot of equipment moving around. Um, just be careful. So often kids just think that they're above that or that they're invincible and you know, it's so easy to just not listen. I rode the tractor with my dad and with my grandpa and um, we've had this discussion with my husband on several times and I've got him convinced now that he's not taking our grandkids out anymore either. But it does tend to be something that people view as a tradition, but there's a whole lot of better traditions that you can establish in your family, whether it's playing with your kids with tractors in the sandbox or buying them right on tractors or taking them out and helping, having them help with these age appropriate tasks. I think farming has changed in safety aspects because the tractors are all cabbed now. They have buddy seats with seat belts. So I feel more um, comfortable with our kids in the tractor, honestly, because I know that when they're riding along, they're seat belted. If something would happen, that they'd be okay. We think it's a fantastic thing for children to work on farms. I grew up working on a farm. It teaches you a great work ethic. It, it teaches kids responsibility. You develop that pride in being a farmer or a farmer's child. We have Colton, our oldest, he's 11. We have him do chores in the barn when the dairy cattle aren't in there anymore. He washes down the holding area. Um, he also helps bed the steers, which we do that when they're locked out of the building, so that's a little bit safer. Knowing where they are, knowing what they're doing, knowing what they're going to be doing, and we run with walkie-talkies a lot too, so that we can talk to them and stay in communication with them. That's part of the message and what we're trying to get out here is in everything you do, safety is big. We're really, really proud of our farmers. We depend on you for food, for fuel, for education, for entertainment, and we think that farming is a great, great occupation. We also know it's a very dangerous occupation. We know that it's important that we keep that next generation interested in farming, but also that we keep them safe. Farming is our future. Kids may not remember the things you say, but they're studying your actions every day. Teach by example and do things right to ensure a good sleep each and every night. As a tribute to the generations before, what you pass down will be much more than the land, the buildings, and the rows. A farmer knows you reap what you sow. It's hard work, but it's as nice a life as you can find.
pretty powerful stuff. I do have to thank the families. Because every time I watch this, it's still one of those that you kind of go, oh my gosh, you know, this, this happens. And it's one of those where people always say, well, it's not going to happen to me. You know, we're okay. It's not a big deal. Well, in a split second, it becomes a really, really big deal. And one of the things that we took back when we talked to the farm families, especially the Brunings and the Lindowskis, was the fact that, you know, they didn't want to do it at first. They didn't want to do a video. They said, you know what? All people are going to do is they're going to blame us. They're going to think we're really horrible parents to let these kind of things happen to our kids. And we said, that, you know, that's okay. I mean, it's totally up to you, and we understand. But then they came back to us and they said, you know what? We have to tell the story. We have to tell the story. Because we can prevent one of these things from happening to another farm family. It's all worth it. So I really am grateful for those families to be able to share and to do that kind of stuff along the way. Um, so it is. But now we're coming to the part of this thing where we talk about audience participation. And that's you folks on audience participation. One of the things that we as an insurance company do is we go out and visit a lot of farms and we take a lot of pictures. And sometimes we take some very interesting pictures um, that we want to talk about. And today I want to have a few folks that I want to I show you some pictures. And I want you to tell me, first of all, what is it a picture of? You're all farmers, you'll know what the pictures are. What might be the hazards that we might see with those photos? And what we might be able to do to correct the situation? So everybody ready? Are we ready? OK, thank you. All right, here's the first one. What is it? Yeah, manure lagoon. Any problems that you see with it? No fence. Very good. Any other issues with it? The other issue that we have with it is that there aren't any barriers. So as you're bringing equipment in and you're unloading, if there's not a stop, sometimes that equipment keeps right on going. And sometimes the operator is still with the equipment when it keeps on going. We generally have a couple of those a year that we wind up having to deal with. Fortunately, most of them don't have the operator still in them when they get into the lagoon, but it does happen. So again, yeah, the correction that would be taken is obviously putting a fence around it. In the wintertime, when it's covered with snow, someone could very easily get into it. I mean, actually, we had a, a live case where we had one of our agents a number of years back was on a farm and walked around behind the farm and actually did go into a lagoon. Fortunately for him, the story was good. We got him out, and he did okay. Um, and he was able to tell the story. But again, you think about a child, maybe friends of your kids that are running around. They may not see it. It's not protected with a fence could be a really bad day. So again, fencing is huge. Putting up stop barriers so that when you are taking equipment in and you're dumping things into the lagoon, the vehicle actually has a stop there so that it cannot slide in um, is one of the things that we're looking at. All right, next photo. What do we have? He had a manure spreader. Any problems with it? The guard, yeah. You know, that's one of the things we want to talk about because whether this guard was intentionally removed or whether the guard just fell off because of wear and tear, that's one of the things that we really want to make sure of. And it's part of the things on your assessment when you take a look at things, especially this time of year before we get into the planting season and things get really, really hectic for you. Now's the great time to check. Check all the equipment. Make sure the guards are in place. If something is rattling and just about to fall off, let's make sure we correct it so that these type of things don't happen. Obviously, when this thing is moving and that chain is moving pretty fast, you don't want to be near it. And you definitely don't want to have any kind of loose clothing in it to be brought into that sucker uh, because it's not a good day at that point. It's going to leave a mark. So again, those are the kind of things on a prevention basis, on just a routine maintenance basis, that you want to make sure with your equipment that everything is in its proper place and that the guards are done. And especially now before we get into the planting season, things get really busy to be able to take that safety check and go forward with it. And then we got this guy. We know what this is? Yeah, the PTO. And I'm sure that you have this conversation with your kids and with everybody else about never, ever, 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 never cross that PTO. I'm sure you do. And I'm sure that as things get really busy and things get really crazy and there's something on the other side and you could walk all the way around it if you could or if you had the time to walk all the way around it, but sometimes it's just easier to go across. That's where problems can occur, and especially with kids if they're close by. Again, 
When it's moving, it takes no prisoners. That's one of those things that we want to make sure of, that we have the right protection, we have the right safety measures, you have it ingrained in everybody that not only do you not cross it, you make sure it's turned off, you make sure nobody's in the tractor to accidentally turn it back on when somebody's back there working on it. You just want to make sure that all those things are in place. And now I'm going to bring Laura back up and we're going to talk about a segment called Near Misses. Back to that manure spreader picture, you know, the one that doesn't have the guard on the back. When John and I first started working together, he showed me that picture. I'm like, that's the same spreader I have. And it looks exactly like that. And I said, that guard is really hard to keep on because when you back up where we push off manure, it hits a wall every time. And so I'm happy to say that there is a guard on that now. It is brand new and shiny and does not match the rest of the spreader. That is for sure. Um, through, the, through the work that I've been able to do with John and with Rural Insurance, I have really come to look at maintenance on equipment in a whole different way. The maintenance that you do on your equipment is a farm safety program because um, if your equipment is functioning properly, there will be less accidents. Um, my one example of that is my husband was mixing feed and it just happened to be Mother's Day. And uh, he put the first bucket of feed into our mixer and the bucket came off in the mixer. And the mixer is empty, except for that one load bucket of feed. So now we have a problem, right? It's Sunday, I said it's Mother's Day, we have to get that bucket out of there. And I know the way that we did that was not very safe. It involved the me and the skid loader backing up when he climbed in the, the mixer and wrapped a chain around it. And my job was to back up until the, the bucket came out. Well, as I'm backing up and there's tension on the chain, I'm think like, you know, I, I had like geometry in school. So I'm like, that bucket is going somewhere and there's a lot of pressure on it. You know, it's coming straight towards me in the skid loader. And if we were thinking ahead, we would have taken the glass door off. We, we didn't do that, but it did, it came out and it, and you know, as I was backing up, I kept thinking, these, these side braces are really strong on this skid loader. Like I'm convincing myself, really, we should have just stopped and figured out a safer way to do that. It did smash back into me and the glass all fell on me and I was fine, other than very, very scared. And, but it's just an example of how when we're in a hurry and we're going fast, things can happen, right? Have you had some of those times at your dairy or your farm when you know you just should have slowed down? You just should have slowed down and it would have been safer. Um, and so back to the maintenance, that bucket was loose. We knew it was getting loose and we should have fixed it before it came off on the inside of the TMR mixer. I do want you to start thinking about your own near misses. If you have been farming long enough, there has been a day where you have looked back at it and really understood how lucky you were that everyone came through that day alive because it's part of farming that we push a little too hard and we make decisions on the fly and, and it's hard business. Real accidents do happen. And so I want to share with you another story to get you thinking about your near misses on your farm. This one has to do with my daughter, Julia, and it was about seven years ago. She was four, not quite five. And I can remember she and I were working on mixing calf bottles and so we were in the milk house and we have a glass door where you can look out towards where we mix feed, but it's kind of a little bit around the corner. And so my husband was out there in the skid loader mixing feed, it was the morning again, and Julia was right by my side, it was winter, I can remember we had winter hats and winter coats on. And I was busy, and you know, okay, we're moms, right? We have our eye on them most of the time, but then we always get that time when our heart drops, when they were just right here and now we can't find them. And so I look around, I'm like, oh, she's not here. And so I went out the door and um, I will never ever forget because she was walking straight towards my husband in the skid loader. And we have a big skid loader and it, 
there's no way he could ever hear her. She had her winter hat on, so she couldn't hear me screaming her name at the top of my lungs. And I ran and picked her up, and she was about five feet away from him. And I'll just never forget that moment and how close it was. And it didn't matter that I had told her so many times she could not go anywhere near the skid loader when dad was driving it. He can't hear you. He can't see you. It didn't, it didn't matter. That still happened. And so I'll, I can still remember shaking her hard by the shoulders and telling her she can never do that again. And so I know you've had those moments. I want you to think about it because I believe that our near misses, that those days when something didn't happen that could have, those are our reminders that we need to remember to be safe and slow down because as moms, many times we're the ones who are the voice of farm safety at our farms. And so don't discount that, remember that. But also, we are all so lucky because farming is dangerous and hard work. And we accept some of those risks because we absolutely love what we do. And so next, I would like to have Kathy Mess come forward. And I want to start out by just saying I am so happy that, um, that she is as brave as she is. She's never been one at a loss for words. And uh, as you might know, Carrie Mess is her daughter-in-law. And uh, Carrie's never at a loss for words either. And so um, what we're going to do is have Kathy share her story with all of you. And so Kathy, if you just kind of want to walk us through, I think it was in July, the, July the day. 6th, July 6th. Um, I, do, I did the cow feeding on the farm, which was skid loader into the TMR on a truck. I forgot to go check to see how much feed was in front of the cows and got up there with the full load and tons of feed left. What am I going to do? Park, went back, parked the truck and got out, and being out of routine, forgot to set the emergency brake. And I, just as I got out, it started to roll, and so I tried to hop back in, and the rear duels ran over my leg. Um, the, I tried yelling a couple of times, and then went, what are you doing? Nobody's going to hear you here on the farm. So went for my phone, couldn't find my phone, then realized I couldn't find my pocket that the phone was in. Um, and it, yeah, it was gone. And looked up and around, and there was my boot with something red sticking out of it. And a little further, there was my phone. Well, I, I didn't look back at the boot. Yeah, no. So, I crawled up to the phone and I called 911 and I was so, there's a whole lot of luck because we have an EMT that lives two miles down the road. He happened to be getting into his truck when, I, when the call went out. And he got to the farm, he didn't know where I was because my husband was on the other side of the shed and he's like, where's the accident? Well, my husband had no idea that there was an accident. Um, but yeah, it, to me it seemed like he got there right away. Um, my son has, my son was in the barn milking. He has friends on the fire department and so somebody said, you have to get out there. There's been an accident. I got to see him run up and then, you know, stop and take a couple steps backwards in shock. Um, and I was wait for a little while longer as, as firemen and everybody showed up, but then eventually I passed out, whether shock or loss of blood, I'm not sure. Um, was so, so fortunate that that EMT happened to be getting into his truck. Was so, so fortunate that my phone, I had a flip phone phone survived getting ripped out of my pants and flying through the air. It still worked. 
just a whole lot of luck right up to that point. Um, I don't know what happened after that because I was out for a couple weeks. In total, I had 13 surgeries. Um, I think eight of them were in that first, oh, maybe 10 or 11 were in the first two weeks. And uh, just, let's see, don't know what else to say. Tell us about your family and just, you know, how all of this, from your perspective, Kathy, how it affected them and, and you know, the farm and, you know, one layer out from you, how, how, how your accident affected the way of life. Um, it was, for them, it was very hard. Um, they, my husband just didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, he just, he couldn't fathom it. it, it uh, we, one of the best things that everybody did was everybody took turns coming in to see me. I was in the hospital four and a half to five months and there was always somebody coming in to see me so that I got to see somebody every day. Uh, another great piece of fortune, we had a brother, my husband's brother-in-law had been laid off a couple years ago. He came out and he took over the house and he took, you know, so he had meals ready for everyone and he did the running around picking up things that they needed. Um, we had lots of neighbors that came over and like the morning I got hurt, the neighbors came over and did the milking. Um, the one, we have one neighbor down the road has 10 kids in the family and uh, I don't know if it was the same day or the day after, but he called a safety meeting with, you know, got everybody in and sat him down for a safety meeting. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else. It, it's, it's one of those things you know you shouldn't do, but you get caught in the moment you know, it just takes a second to be, forget what you're doing. So, um, give us an update on what's happening now with oh, you. Yes, yes. Um, they are working on a prosthesis for me, and I actually got to try it on a uh, week ago and walk with it a little. Of course, on parallel bars, but I got to walk with it a little bit, and that was that was a lot of fun. That was kind of nice. <laughs> so um, I was surprised how well I did, um, especially since I haven't been. I'm supposed to be exercising on the walker and all that stuff. It's like that just is fun. <laughs> it's <real> fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was really anxious to get home, but discovered that home means uh, in the hospital. There's a nurse or a doctor or even a cleaning person in the room every hour at least. And at home, they're busy out in the field and you got nobody around for maybe eight hours. So, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm looking very forward, I can drive. It's just a little problem with getting into the car. <laughs> um, I am hoping that I'll be able to do a few more things once I get a prosthesis going. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of me, you know, being in the hospital for five months is kind of interesting in itself, but yeah, Kathy, fun. Do, do you have any advice? to give those of us out there who day in and day out are, are maybe, you know, in a role very similar to yours? Um, I was, my mistake was stepping out of my routine. That, that was my mistake, was stepping out of my routine because uh, I wasn't rushing or anything except for the fact of trying to get back in the truck. Um, yeah, I, and as far as one of the saving graces is the family coming to see you every day. To have somebody there all the time to make sure you're okay. 
Um, my, in fact, my daughter-in-law took over the first month, month and a half. Um, she was my bulldog. She kept track of what was going on with the surgeries and that kind of thing. So until she had Silas. <laughs> So let's give Kathy just a tremendous round of applause. Um, I'm sure there's more I wanted to say, but right now it's gone. So <laughs> it usually happens. The lights yeah. are really bright. <laughs> yeah. And so what I hear from Kathy is, we were so lucky. We were fortunate. Can you hear that? Did you hear how many times she said that? And so your story is so compelling to all of us and your bravery and the way you look back on it and see the good um, of the EMT being so close, of the way your family came together. Um, your story is inspirational, Kathy. So thanks once again for sharing your story with us. One more round of applause for Kathy. You're going to add some? Okay, and with that, I'm going to have John come and we're going to transition over to a little bit more on that farm safety assessment. You could, we all received a copy of that, so go ahead and pull that out. Once again, the insurance part of me is going to come out, and that's what the farm safety assessment is all about. When we go out and take a look at your farm, these are the things that we're looking for. We talk about the emergency preparedness, you know, all the hazard assessments that are going on, the working surfaces, the ladders, the electrical, the fire safety, the farm machinery. Basically, they're going through that checklist and taking a look. So I encourage you, take it with you. Use it as a guide, because if you're able to go through that and check things off, chances are that you have a very safe operation. Now, obviously, we can't guarantee 100% of the time that you're never going to have an incident. I'm sure Kathy never thought she would have an incident either, but it does happen. But what I can tell you is that if you do follow it and you are able to check most of these things off, chances are the likelihood of you having it is greatly reduced. And again, if you have a chance to jot down one or two things that you want to take a look at, maybe it's making sure those guards are in place making sure that thing that's been rattling around forever is finally secure. Maybe it's, you know what, we gotta make sure that we have not 20 extension cords plugged into the electrical box running around all over the place. We may have to get it rewired just a little bit to make that happen. Maybe it's something like that that you can jot down and say, I'm gonna check it when I get back home. That's all really good stuff that you can work with. And then we wanna think about the impact that you have. There's a number that I have, and, and you know, Kathy probably has a really, really big number based on the fact that she was in the hospital for four or five months. But the one number that I come away with is $143,580. Anybody know what that number is? $143,580. That number represents 10 days in the hospital. That's in the hospital. That's not the docs. It's not the nurses, it's not the meds, that's the hospital. It can add up really, really fast. And I'm sure that Kathy's bill is in the seven figures uh, when you take a look at it on an itemized basis. Um, so again, it can be really, really, really expensive. We all know of a small organization by the name of OSHA. If you would happen to have an employee with a fatality, I can guarantee you they're gonna come and say hi. And generally it's not a social visit that they're going to do. Um, so again, it can have a major impact on you. And then, of course, there's organizations like us. We also are kind of curious as to how come, what happened. And the implications on your insurance can be significant. There can be increases in your premium, or there can be cancellations because of what happened. So again, take the assessment. Take it home with you. Take a look at it. Discuss it with your, with your family. Discuss it with your employees. And make sure that you know, things are in, sh in shape and ready to go. And I'll have Laura come in. I know we're at the end of our time to talk, uh, but I want Laura to wrap it up for us as well. So here's Laura. 
Just real quick, we're at the end of our time. Uh, once again, I want to extend my gratitude to Kathy because I think that this, for me, will be memorable. And I think hopefully for all of you, and you go home, and you think about ways that you can make the culture of your farm still based on all the great traditions that we have, still based on having your children be able to work with you side by side, but maybe think about changing some of those traditions that aren't quite as safe. And so, and also just think about making safety part of the culture, part of the values of your farm um, for your family, but also for the example that you can set for so many other farms. So thank you on behalf of both John and I for your time and attention today and enjoy the rest of the summit.